Hi everyone, today we're continuing our new message series looking at Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel is full of good news. In fact, it opens with the words, the beginning of good news about Jesus the Messiah. It's all about Jesus and his life-changing announcement of the Kingdom of God coming near. Last week, I gave an overview of the Gospel, explained a little about the significance of the Kingdom of God and what this revolution announced by Jesus was really about, and one aspect of that being the outrageous love that he showed to all kinds of people, irrespective of, of who they were or how society viewed them, or even because of what they'd done. Now, if you haven't seen this opening message, it might be worth doing so. Today, we're skipping on to chapter 4 and to one of the most well-known accounts about Jesus, his calming a violent storm. This passage, depicted through the centuries in classical art, is familiar to many because it's easy to apply to situations today. Not in terms of being caught up in a storm in a boat on a Galilean lake, but because we all relate to being caught up in the storms of life. The times we've just lived through have been unlike anything most people have ever witnessed before, as we've watched day by day the impact of a global pandemic sweeping across the world, exacting a high price in terms of human life and spreading fear, anxiety and a sense of paralysis. Now, whatever circumstances you find yourself in right now, you can take comfort that Jesus has authority over them. The key is where or in whom you place your faith. Faith in Jesus Christ is never misplaced. If he can calm a violent storm of the sea with one word, Jesus can calm the storms of life as well. So let's continue reading from Mark's Gospel in the Bible. The miracle of Jesus calming the storm is also recorded in the other two synoptic gospels at Matthew and Luke. So Mark chapter 4 verses 35 through to 41 and they read. That day when evening came he said to his disciples let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. What's the significance then, if any, of this account of Jesus calming a violent storm to your life right now? It's this. Life is full of unexpected storms and any help to navigate through them is pretty valuable. The region in the Holy Land, known as the Galilee, often featured in Jesus' teaching, and this is exactly where we find ourselves in our passage in Mark. Jesus had been teaching near the Sea of Galilee. The Sea, or, or the Lake of Galilee, it's also known by different names in the Bible, like Tiberias, or Gennesaret, or, or Kinnereth, is about 13 miles, lo 13 miles long and at 8 miles wide. Remarkably, it's the lowest freshwater lake on our planet. It's a low-lying position, together with the almost unbroken uh, uh, ring or uh, uh, wall of hills all around it. It meant that the lake could be subject to sudden, violent storms. Galilee's waters could be rapidly whipped up by the wind, posing an immediate danger to any small boats caught out on the lake. What is more, unlike the image we may have of what a modern fishing boat looks like, an incredible discovery during a drought in 1986 means that we have the remains of an ancient Galilean boat dating from the first century AD. It's a beautifully preserved example of the kind of boat used in Jesus' day. Back to the text. Jesus, having been teaching near the lake, wanted some respite from the crowds and decided to take a boat with the disciples to the opposite shore. Luke's account records that not long after they sailed, Jesus fell asleep and a storm arose. Now, should this surprise us? Uh, no, not really. What we clearly see in this account is both the humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ, that is, Jesus being fully God. 
Both of these aspects of Jesus are important for us to understand because from them we can learn useful lessons to help face and overcome the unexpected storms of life. First, Jesus was fully human and because of that he is like you and me. He had the same basic needs that we all have. He experienced the same things that you and I do. Now we can clearly see in the passage two pointers that reveal the humanity of Jesus. First, he needed rest and time away from crowds. And, and second, he tired. He was so exhausted that even the battering of the boat by the waves didn't wake him up. So, Jesus was fully human and experienced the same things we do. That means whatever fears and anxieties we might be facing and experiencing at the moment, we can draw strength from knowing that Jesus too was fully human and knows what it is to experience the same emotions we do. Jesus is not distant, or detached from our circumstances. He understands how we're feeling when a storm hits. Elsewhere in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, we discover more about Jesus' humanity. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, we read, for this reason he, Jesus, had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And then in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to uh, feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he didn't sin. These verses make it clear that Jesus is like us and fully able to sympathise with us, not only in our strengths, but in our weaknesses. The truth is, if we will allow it to permeate our minds and our being, uh, it will bring much comfort and peace when all around us is, is unease. Returning to our account in Mark's Gospel, although the text doesn't say much, uh, doesn't say which of the disciples were with Jesus on the boat, it's probable that there were seasoned fishermen on board. These men would have been quite familiar with the ways of the sea. Certainly this wouldn't be the first school they'd seen on the Sea of Galilee, which as we have said uh, was known for its sudden kind of raging storms. However, in this incident, even these professional fishermen were frightened by this storm to the point of fearing they would die. But what of Jesus? The waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Jesus' sleep was deep and sound, even through the chaos of the storm. So despite Jesus' full humanity, that's being like you and me, there was something different shaping his behaviour. There was a total confidence in his heavenly Father uh, and of his Father's protection of him. Perhaps you recall that great promise of God heard when Moses speaks to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified be uh, because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Likewise, there is a deep-seated peace promised to every Christian believer. Recall Philippians chapter 4, verses 5 through to 7. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about everything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which trans all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This leads well on to our second point. Jesus exercised faith in the storm. He didn't just talk a good talk when life was going well. This is why Jesus, when he was awakened, rebuked the disciples with the question, do you still have no faith? The disciples' lack of faith reminds us that even those who lived and walked with Jesus, saw his miracles and heard his message, still found it difficult to be 100% faith-filled all the time. In that way, we're like Jesus' disciples. Their lack of faith was rebuked, and in the same way, so is ours. If Jesus was able to rescue the disciples from the storm, he's also able to rescue us from the storms of everyday life, sickness, grief, job loss, relationship issues, even the, the sting of death itself. The Lord never promised that we wouldn't see a storm in life. As a matter of fact, he told us to expect trouble. Rather, he has promised that he will be with us in the storm. He will never leave his children alone in the midst of trouble. Uh, with perseverance, they will overcome. 
Now, if you'd like to think about this topic uh, in more detail, there's a message, a faith that works uh, when life is hard. It's available on our YouTube channel and may be of interest to you. It talks about things worth remembering, about problems, that problems happen, that they vary, they're unpredictable, but problems have a purpose. And then there's the challenge to remember, problems can be productive. Yeah, problems test my faith. Problems develop uh, our perseverance. Problems even mature our character. And then the talk goes on to explore how to respond to the difficulties in life. This leads me on to our third point. This passage not only reveals Jesus' true humanity, but also Jesus' deity, because only God can make the winds and the water obey. Just the fact that Jesus sleeps is a clue to his divinity. How? Jesus didn't fear the wind and the waves or anything that they could do to him. The Creator need not be restless in the face of a dangerous creation. When Jesus sleeps in the stern of the boat, he does so in confidence. He doesn't lose sleep on account of weather patterns. Jesus is more than a teacher. He's a miracle worker. But Mark, in his Gospel, wants the reader to understand more. Jesus has the authority of the Creator himself. With one word from him, the storm is abated and the sea becomes calm. The disciples marvelled at this powerful display of Jesus' supernatural ability over the elements. In subduing the sea and wind, Jesus demonstrated his power to, his, the, to the disciples and revealed himself as God's saving and sovereign presence amongst them. The forces of nature submit to him, just as they did to the God of Israel when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea in the Exodus from Egypt. Only God can do this. This is evidence of Jesus' deity. This passage is the first of three miracles that Mark reports on in quick succession. These deeds of power are just some of the many miracles reported in the Gospel. Healings, miraculous feedings, exorcisms, raising from the dead. They point to Jesus' identity and vocation and connect with his proclamation that the kingdom of God has come. In other words, they signpost the astonishing truth that God's healing, at restoring future, had broken into the present. And this is what happens when God is in charge. Understanding the truth of who Jesus the Messiah really is, is transformative. It is in him that our confidence is best placed during a storm. This leads me on to my fourth and final point. First, faith in Christ is never misplaced. If he can calm the storms of the sea with one word, he can calm the storms of life as well. So Jesus deserves to be the focus of our faith. In essence, Christian faith is choosing to believe what God says is true. It is choosing to believe the Bible's view of how things are and not the current or prevailing circumstances. We are to resist allowing the world to squeeze us into its mould. Rather, we are to have our minds renewed by God's word so that we can test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. But how do we do that? Uh, and what is faith? The schoolboy boy answer is, faith is trying hard to believe what you know isn't true. Actually, it is the reverse. Faith is believing what is already true. God is truth. Our responsibility is to believe truth, whether it feels true or not. Second, effective faith depends on what or in whom you believe. Everyone lives and operates by faith. The issue is not what we believe, because we all believe in something or, or someone. We all have a way at looking at reality, deciding what we think is true and making decisions accordingly, even if that's just, say, trusting the chair that you're currently sitting on. The important issue about faith is that it depends on what or whom we believe in. That is the object of our faith. That's the really important issue about faith. That's the difference between Christian and non-Christian faith. Jesus Christ is the ultimate faith object. Jesus taught that we only need the faith as small as a tiny mustard seed to move a mountain. That's Matthew 17 verse 20. 
it doesn't depend so much on the amount of faith, but on whom we put our faith in. It's not our power that moves the mountain, it's God's. How much faith we have is determined by how well we know the one we put our faith in. Faith then becomes finding out what is true and believing it. God has not given uh, us the option to make up what we believe. It's about making a choice to believe what God says is true and then living our lives by it. As we close, I'm reminded of a song by Northern Irish singer-songwriter Robin Mark, Will Your Anchor Hold, uh, with the following lyrics. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift? or firm remain. It's a beautiful song that asks some searching questions. Where is your faith? Who are you anchored to? Questions equally important uh, to those who already profess to be Christians as for those who do not yet know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we've had uh, to look at this uh, passage of Jesus uh, calming the storm uh, and just the encouragement to us in our faith. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can have the confidence that you are there with us, that you are sovereign over all. Father, help us to put our trust and our faith in you then and not in ourselves. And so we pray all these things. In Jesus' name. Amen.